Let's get joined up. Today's show is brought to you by Audible, and right now you can get a free audiobook download and 30 day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash joined up. There's over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. So thanks for tuning in to the Joined Up Writing Podcast, a regular show about all things writing, including interviews with authors, screenwriters, and key figures from the publishing industry. Plus, loads of hints and tips and inspiration for all kinds of creatives. You can follow us on Twitter at JU Podcast, leave a quick iTunes review, or just tell a friend. Right, cue the cheesy theme tune. Put down your pen and stop your typing. Grab yourself a drink, cause it's joined up right here. Hello and welcome to the Joined Up Writing Podcast, where a little procrastination can go a long way. I'm Wayne Kelly and it's episode 96, a special unplanned bonus episode because I managed to get an interview with BAFTA winning producer and screenwriter Jeff Pope. Jeff's written dozens of superb TV and films, including Philomena with Steve Coogan, Cradle to the Grave with Danny Baker, Pierpoint, Little Boy Blue, and his most recent film, Stan and Ollie, which I was lucky enough to see last week. It stars Steve Coogan and John C. Riley in the untold story of Laurel and Hardy's British tour in 1953. It's funny, poignant, and I can't recommend it enough, and it's out in the UK today. I managed to catch up with Jeff on the set of his latest project, so there is some background noise in a couple of places as we we were chatting on the phone, but stick with it because he's got loads to say about Stan and Ollie, but also his own writing journey, and he's got some advice for writers in any genre. So I hope you enjoy the conversation as much as I did, so let's crack on with it. Yeah, well, thanks for taking the time to talk to us. Anyway, I appreciate it. Um, And congrats on Stan and Ollie opening in the UK today. I got the chance to see it uh, last week in Glasgow uh, and absolutely loved it. It was brilliant. Uh, So congrats on that. Thank you. Uh, So just to start us off, yeah, just give us a bit of a flavour for the people that maybe have somehow missed the promotion and stuff. Give us a bit of a flavour of the story and what inspired you to want to tell that story. Well, I've been a a Laurel and Hardy fan um, since a little boy. Um, And it it goes back to, as a a kid, watching it um, it on on Saturday morning television, so I uh, I kind of fell in love with them at that age. And then uh, what happened was, is I, I I read a lot, and um, I must have been a holiday quite a few years ago now. I, I read a book, and then got me intrigued. Read another book, and started to think about it. Mm-hmm. But the well, the penny dropped when I realised that what I should be doing here is not doing a biopic, not trying to cover the whole of their life. But really the story I, dis- I decided I wanted to tell was a love story. Mm-hmm. And, and the, the, way I, the way I found of doing that was to concentrate on this period towards the end of their life. Mm-hmm. And it was a period when they realized how much I think, truly for the first time in all their time together, when they realized what they meant, how, how much they meant to each other. And they could kind of look back at that point, as you say, on that career. Yeah, what had happened was they 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 were very different people, um, Laurel and Hardy. Um, Stan was very intense and very driven and a workaholic, and Oliver was much more happy-go-lucky and content to um, to do a day's work and then go off and play golf and relax. Mm-hmm. And this meant that they didn't they were, they were clearly admired each other hugely uh, and and realised how perfectly um, suited they were as a double act, but it. It didn't mean they were necessarily close offset, and they, you know, they they didn't hang out, they didn't um, socialise really together. Mm-hmm. Um, but on this tour, the, the 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 pressure cooker of this tour, which was a huge amount of travel, uh, being forced together in in dingy um, guest houses, um, small provincial theatres, uh, tr- endless train journeys, they were thrown together and lived in each other's pockets and became as close in real life as they had been in their movies, I think. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of where you picked it up. And as you say, you found that, that kind of that love affair. So when you wrote it, did you write it on, on spec? Was it just something that you wanted to do? Like you say, it came out of this interest. 
initially I, I just just wrote it because I mean I talked to some people but I, I yes I didn't wait to have any kind of deal in place I, I I wrote it but that was that was more than ten years ago that mm. I the first version of this and I I had I suppose my technique or my process would be I I I, I like to know where I'm going. Mm-hmm. Um, I suppose every writer does, but <laughs> some don't. You know, some yeah, writers some of like fiction. To just find it, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I wanted to, I wanted to know where I was going, and I, I had a very strong image, which was Stan and Ollie in bed together for real. Mm-hmm. That sounds rather odd. I don't, I don't mean in, in any <laughs> well, kind of romantic. The, I, way. I've seen the film, so I know what you mean. But yeah, <laughs> yes. So I wanted to, to realistically find a moment where in real life they shared a bed. Mm -hmm. And I wanted that moment to be because they cared for each other so much. Mm -hmm. And so obviously in their films, you know, they they famously shared a bed like Morecambe and Wise did. Uh, And I wanted to, that that was what I, that was the moment I was reaching for. I thought, no, I want to find a moment where that happens for real. And of course, you know, then what comes off that is, is it, it then follows that you need, I needed to, to find a way to illustrate why they, why that was un, why that at some point in the in the story would be unlikely, mm-hmm. and that's to do with their history and the problems they had in the past and uh, finding a way through that and so on. Yeah, well, absolutely. Well, as I say, you've you've pulled it off, and it's clever as well. The, the Stan and Ollie thing is clever in itself because obviously you're showing us the men behind the characters. It's not it's not um, Laurel and Hardy. It's Stan and Ollie, and I think that works really really well what what do you think kind of makes this so universal because i mean i'm a laurel and hardy fan but i still think i still maintain yeah. lots of non laurel and hardy fans and particularly younger people or people that might not think they're into laurel and hardy would enjoy it so what do you think makes it so universal it's, it's the themes of of love friendship loyalty um uh companionship i think what i loved as a kid with laurel and hardy was having a friend that close Mm-hmm. Everyone can relate to having a best friend, mm-hmm. um, and there's there's a there's a there's a line in the in the film which is which is very true of Laurel and Hardy, which is when when Stan talks about that in their movies, no one else knows who they are. Mm-hmm. They they only seem to exist for each other. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, even their wives appear in a in an odd <laughs> way, strangers to them. Yeah, um, and so I I think I think having someone who come what may will be there for you is something that we all find comforting yeah well absolutely you've, you've pulled it off and mentioning the wives there are the wives in real life obviously which uh another another two stars in the film it's kind of the other the other yeah. comedy duo in the film that works so well and in fact they in, in some cases they get some of the biggest laughs of the film was that quite important to you when you started out or did that kind of develop through drafts um, it's both. Um, I, I initially had, uh, I was quite passionate that I didn't want the wives to just be ciphers. I didn't want them to just be defined by their husbands, mm-hmm. you know, that they would just be wringing their hands and worried about their husbands. Mm-hmm. And I wanted them to have a life of their own. And there was, the, 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 the you know, I was on fertile ground because um, Ida was a very dramatic uh, <laughs> Eastern European lady with a the showbiz past of her own. And, and Lucille was very different. Lucille is a um, apple pie wholesome American girl, and the two were because they were so different. It was rich territory, got conflict and so I, away, yeah. I, yes. And then I'd written something in the uh, draft where ne- um, Nina's character says, "I don't, I don't like this Delphon. You know, you should be staying at the best hotels. I don't like Delphon." Yeah. And because she's so clever, she started to do that thing where. She was brought into theatres and then said, "No, no, I don't want to sit next to him." And so we worked <laughs> yeah, worked cool. on that, and that became funnier and funnier. And so, yeah, I, it was very, I was very, it was very important to me that the, that the women weren't just the wives. Yeah, well, it's, it's successful, as I say. It's really good, and it's a really nice, it's a nice counterbalance in the film. So, so just hmm. taking a step back a little bit and just talking about you uh, in general with your writing. So, I just wanted to talk yes. a little bit about how you came to writing in the. F- first place i mean was it something that you did as a child when did you realize it was something you enjoyed and that you had a bit of a talent for 
Well, I, 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 looking back, I never dreamed that I would make my living doing it. But I, yes, at school, I was always the one who liked to write plays. I'm not talking about you know any any anything um, <laughs> shattering, but. Thing, yeah. Yeah, sketch, exactly. Sketches and comedy stuff. And in the sixth form, you know, I, I loved review kind of stuff. And I, I always uh, loved to do that. I always loved that that feeling, that power, I suppose, of, mm-hmm. of, of forming stuff and creating stuff. And then my first job was as a journalist. I worked on local newspapers and... Um, that was, you know, that again. That's about gathering together material and then uh, ter- creating out of that uh, uh, a uh, a story, you know, which makes mm-hmm. sense with a beginning and a middle and an end. Mm-hmm. And I, I guess I'm still doing that. You know, it's just that now it's not an article in a newspaper; it's a screenplay and it's a movie. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I, I kind of went sideways into it. I didn't sort of. Uh, have a burning ambition to do what I'm doing now. Although I realize as the take each different step in my career, I realized that probably that was what I knew I wanted to do all along without it actually expressing itself in so many words. So I, you know, I, I when I worked in television, I worked on, uh, I worked in factual programs and then I, I would gravitated towards um, stuff about documentaries about crime. Mm-hmm. And it seemed to me a small step to go from a documentary about crime to a dramatization of a crime. Mm-hmm. And that's what happened. I, I, um, I, I moved into it with small steps. And so uh, was on that, was that the Brinks mat thing? Was that, was that your first thing that you did? That was my first proper drama was yeah. uh, Fool's Gold, the story of the yeah. Brinks mat robbery. And what was exciting was that I, that happened because uh, I I realised as I researched that story, I realised that they 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 come up with this incredible plan, mm-hmm. and you know whatever you talk about the morality and the violence, obviously which I'm not condoning, no. but the, the sheer cleverness of the plan to 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 steal the money mm-hmm. um, on one level you look at that and think it were it was clever mm-hmm. uh, but what they go through all the the, the uh they go through the the agony of uh, of that day when they stole the money and then it was then they tr- then they tried to give it back because they got such huge prison sentences they tried to give it back yeah. and then they fell out again because obviously there were forces within that group who didn't want to give it back yeah, yeah. so i had that as as an idea and then then I thought, okay, I had a chance to write it, and discovered then and only then really that actually, I, I, yeah, okay, I can do this. I understand how it works. So and you, things like dialogue and yeah. So you say not when you so got, much structure then, but dialogue yeah. certainly came to me quite naturally. Yeah, you found you had a talent for that. So when you, when you say you, you, you sort of got the opportunity, I mean, how did that come about? Was it a case of because presumably because I um, because nobody. But, my then boss um, just sort of trusted me. He, That's great. Yeah. He, he gave me the opportunity. He said, "Okay, you write it." So he, he obviously saw that in you, even if you necess- didn't necessarily fully believe it yourself at the time. Yeah, I was. I was all over him saying, "Let me." And he said, "Okay." <laughs> well, that's good. But you, yeah, you were pushing for. His, it. Na- his name's Robin Paxton. He's an old friend. Yeah. Um, yeah. He was. Yeah, and uh, I still am indebted to him. But it's great, yeah. But it's like all of these things. You got the opportunity, but you got the opportunity. Yeah, you can get no. I this. But you did take. Sorry it. to jump in there, Wayne. Yeah, this happens to me. You're quite right. The next words out of my mouth was, "Now I'm in a position where I can give a break to people and encourage people." Mm-hmm. But I always say, "Yeah, I can give you the opportunity, but but you have to take it." Exactly. And that's really important. So, so when, so yeah. do do you find? Um, so what did you feel when that, because presumably you went off and you wrote that script. I mean, you sound like you were fairly confident anyway, but when you did that first draft or whatever it was and you submitted it, yes. were, you, were you nervous? Were you looking forward to getting some feedback about it? What was that process like initially? No, I was, I was, I was, I was luckier than that. I co-wrote it with a guy called Terry Windsor. I still, um, I, I, we, we've got a drama which has been, uh, it's, it's not, it, it'll come out at some point Eventually. to do with the Hatton Garden 
robbery. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, I, I worked on that with Terry. But um, Terry was a, Terry is a director, and he directed it. And um, so I learned a lot working with him on that first one. We co-wrote that. Um, but but because we made it for a very low budget, we 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 it wasn't quite the same process that I now go through, which is you know idea, treatment, script, green light. You know, we was it was it was okay, write it and we'll make it. Yeah, because you knew so, that smaller budget was there. Yeah, because because we managed because we we managed to do it for a relatively modest budget. We 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 were in go mode right from the beginning. Well, I was going to ask um, you a little bit. And about so that. I don't remember that. Yeah, go on. No, sorry, go go on. Yeah, you don't remember. No, I don't remember that on that. I don't remember that kind of thinking, uh, that nervousness of, uh, are, are we going to be commissioned or not? It's like you know, you've been asked was... to do it and you were doing it, basically. I mean, exactly, yeah. And you got on with it. Well, but I was going to ask you yeah. a little bit about the budget side of things. Like, now when you write stuff, yeah. because one of the things that struck me when I was watching Stan and Ollie, I mean, it, it's yeah. brilliant, but one of the great sort of... Um, conceits or whatever that you've used in it is with the way that you've been able to use the stage setting and the theatrical setting to reenact some of the classic yes. sketches the, from the films yeah. and stuff, you know, yeah. Way Out West and um, County Hospital and yeah. all these different things. And that's brilliant and it works brilliant in the film and it works within this idea that they're on this tour and I know they didn't do all yeah. those, necessarily do all those sketches in real life or whatever, but it doesn't really matter. But, it, but also, from a practical point of view, it obviously works great from a budget point of view, presumably, because you can take all these filming. No, not, not, not a process, no, not anything that would really go into my head other than in a very, very general way. No, I wouldn't, I'm not, I'm not thinking of, of, of budget and stuff when I'm writing it. Mm-hmm. Um, no, they did, they did do a version of County Hospital on stage. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and they did do the double door routine and the yeah, you know, waiting yeah. at the train station. And so, no, I, no, it wasn't, um, it's not no, no never really do I consciously think oh, I've got better scale this in I better do this particularly modestly in, or particularly in the first draft I should imagine when you just want to just let your yes. imagination yeah, go yeah you in. have to you have you have to you have to okay you know what what's the story you want to tell mm-hmm. that's got to be the first draft and if it's um, if it's you've got to give it you've got to you've got to do justice to the story mm-hmm. and then okay fine in late, later drafts there may be yeah, you may have to temper with certain things, your yeah. vision with reality of what the money you've got. Yeah, yeah. So obviously the majority of your work is based around factual drama, or real people, events, that sort of thing. Yeah. And I'm sure you've been asked this before, but why, why do you think that is? And, and particularly I'm always, I, the thing I really admire about that is that you, you never seem inhibited by having to sort of stay true in a general sense anyway to the subject matter or the history. How do you manage to pull that off? I find it liberating because one of the things that drives me on in a lot of what I do is is, is to avoid cliche. Um, I I have a very low tolerance for that, you know. And I, oh, okay, I've seen that. Oh, okay, I know what they're doing now. Mm-hmm. They're doing that in order to do that. Yeah. Whereas if you go really into the DNA of a story of, of events that actually happened. And, how people express themselves, you know, what, what kind of characters they were and how they spoke and how they related. By definition, you're avoiding cliche because we're all unique. Mm-hmm. So I, I, that's how I, that's what I think really excites me. It's, it's, it's that, it's that if you, if you go into the story as opposed to, as it were, pulling back and smoothing the edges off, it, but if you go really into the story and really understand it and get into the real detail of it, then you will come up with something unique. Yeah, because you know, you know, and you know for a fact that it, you know, it did happen. And I'm, I'm guessing yeah. that sometimes there has to be, understandably, there has to be some compromise because you might have to yeah. condense characters or you might have to say, well, that this did happen, but it didn't happen necessarily there or there yeah. or whatever. But it's got to yeah. control. Do, yeah. uh, I know it obviously depends on what what it is that you're doing and the topic and everything. Is. So how much does that play on your mind when you're actually in those early drafts? Is it, is it something you kind of have no, to wrestle it's... with or you just get on with it? No, it's the process. The, look, uh, if, if we take um, Little Boy Blue, mm-hmm. television drama yeah, I did, yeah. there would have been about 60 detectives on that. And that gets reduced to about seven or eight yeah, because yeah. an audience can't possibly comprehend 60 different no. voices. No. So... 
um, there's some stuff that's just pure common sense. Mm -hmm. Other times, you know, a story may be uh, very complex and it does need uh, simplifying in the telling. Mm -hmm. But but the bottom line is it's about being fair. Mm -hmm. So if you've done if you've done the work, if you've done if you've done in if you understood the story and know your characters, then it's about being fair, true to them. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily in the, in the absolute literal sense, because, of course, you know, I'm putting words in the mouth of Stan Laurel. Sure, I didn't yeah. know. I could say for certain that he said them. Yeah, but sure. I ca what I can say is that's the kind of thing he would have said. Sure, yeah. And and I know from we spoke very very briefly on the red carpet for the BFI premiere. I know you, you with Cassidy. Yeah. As to take that as an example, yeah. you with um, Cassidy uh, Stan's great granddaughter. Mm. I know you were talking about it there, and the, you know the fact of the matter is mm. that must mean a lot to you. The fact that she's seen it, she gets it, and she's on board with it. Yeah, yeah, it, it does. It's not the first no. consideration I have because it's the story is the master. But yeah, if you, if uh, is and also I think I, it's not about writing to please anyone. No. But if what what I what was gratifying is that is that someone who may have said you're besmirching the memory of my great grandfather, you know that that that's potentially one outcome from Cassidy seeing it. Mm -hmm. What was really pleasing was that she saw the truth of the piece. Yeah. And that's what she responded to. And that's obviously so, that's, that's, um, so you know you've hit it basically. That's that's kind of what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. The the other thing that strikes me obviously you, you mentioned there uh, little boy blue and you've obviously done yeah. dramas about the Moors murders. You've done stuff about Fred West, some really really heavy topics. But throughout yeah. a lot of your work and like Philomena as well, obviously there's this you know that's kind of this this tragedy at the heart of that. But with a lot of the a lot yeah. of the things that you've done, you seem to be very good at finding the sort of lighter moments or the humour in there. There's always well, there's often a lot of humour in your work. Um, you know, why is comedy so important, even when you're dealing with some of these heavier topics, do you think? And have you got any sort of tips for people when they're trying to find the funny in things? Yeah, I, 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 in a sense, I could be accused of being slightly schizophrenic because <laughs> I have the other wing of what I do is comedy. I work with Carolina Hearn, yeah. Memory I Treasure, and I did a comedy a couple of years ago um, when Danny, Danny Baker, Baker and I yeah. adapted, yeah. So I think um, that the 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 my approach is that I think the best drama and the best comedy are actually very close bedfellows, and it's to do with reality. Mm -hmm. It's to do with um, uh, truth and honesty. So. Caroline, I learned such a lot working with Caroline. And her comedy was all about um, tr uh, the, the, this is how people speak. This is how people talk. Yeah. And it was looking for the comedy in the tiny things. Mm -hmm. You know, like Nana thinking that um, because Anthony's girlfriend was vegetarian, <laughs> desperately trying to come up with food she could eat and offering wafer thin ham was one of the funniest <laughs> lines ever written. Brilliant, yeah. So... No, but but it, it was what, why it was funny was it wasn't a joke. It no, wasn't like no, it's true. Uh, it a sounded, setup and a it had a ring of truth to it. Line. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's true of the drama in Stan and Ollie and the comedy in Stan and Ollie. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so with with Philomena, I mentioned Philomena there. Obviously, you worked with Steve Coogan uh, as a writer yeah. at that time. You collaborated, and you've collaborated with loads of writers. Um, you know, over your career, you've you, you know you seem to be very keen on collaborating. What what are the challenges and the benefits of working as a team as opposed to on your own? And have you kind of got a set way of working, or does it depend on who you're working with? No particularly set way, but my only um, deal breaker is that I control the keyboard <laughs> well, uh, and that, I mean, I'm people, laughing and like saying that. it but it's true <laughs> yeah. yeah no it, I, I it goes back to my journalism days my reporter days because mm -hmm. the reason I do it is is probably an element of control freakery but, but, but I think more than that for me it's as I'm working with someone be it say Steve Coogan and you know you're in the moment and you're you know, with him, it's, it's like being in the room with the different characters. You know, he, he and he's also a brilliant mimic. Yeah. So you know, he could be a barman, he could be Philomena, he could be his character. Yeah. 
but we generate stuff. You know, you're knock, you're sparking off each other, mm-hmm. and suddenly a line or a thought will come out, and I'm desperate to capture that thought yeah. and write it down yeah. before I, you know, the, my paranoia is it will be gone and we won't be able to remember it. Yeah. If actually the reason why he and I hit it off so well working together was if you asked him this question, he'd say. The one thing he hates is <laughs> doing the typing. I was going to say that because I'd had seen and I saw a recent interview actually with him yeah. when he did in New York, and he said that very thing. He mentioned yeah. Philomena, and he said specifically, he said, "Well, you know, I say I do the writing. I wasn't doing the typing because I hate doing the typing." Yeah. So it works yeah. out really, really well. Um, well what? How do yeah. you do? You tend to find mm-hmm. again. Di- I guess it depends on who you're working with and what you're working on. But what? How do you tend to deal with like disagreements? Because uh, I'm sure there's disagreements of opinion at times, or you think it should be done uh, like ne- this or whatever. Yeah, it's never a problem um, because I'm into passion. So if some, you know, if, if 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 someone's arguing for something and it's 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 about passion, mm-hmm. if if they they really and they desperately believe this, then that's okay. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, it. it, it I suppose to flip it round, if if someone wanted to do someone because it was expedient or because it was, they couldn't be asked to do it any other way. That's when there'd be a problem. But I yeah. tend not to work with those kind of people. Yeah, work well, with people that actually care about the thing that you're doing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, on, well, on that subject, you mentioned uh, very briefly cradle to grave there uh, with with Danny. Yeah. Obviously, who you were friend, you've been friends with for a long period of time before that. So tell tell me yeah. how you found that, and more importantly. Is there going to be another series of that at some stage? Because I'm ganging to see another series of it. Uh, well, we know we Danny and I would love to do it. Um, yeah. uh, the the problem has been Peter um, right, Kay, sure, who's yeah. um, just you know for, for for various reasons he's not committed to another series, and so we felt it was very difficult to recast. So that's why there hasn't been another series of that. Working with Danny, I was, I, I was anxious going into it because we'd been friends for so long, and I didn't. We're both very, um, we both have very strong opinions, <laughs> and I, I just didn't. I, I thought I hope this doesn't spoil the friendship because yeah. you know uh, it could have done, but it yeah. didn't. You know, we found a way very quickly. I think it's born out of mutual respect. So we both, we both, you know, um, respected the other person's point of view, and the most important thing in any kind of writing partnership is. If the two component parts, in this case, me and Danny, was stronger and better than either of us on our own. Yeah. So so if you were sitting down to start a new project tomorrow, which given how prolific you are, maybe you are, um, how would yeah. you approach it? Have you got a set way of working? Do you tend to research first? You look at characters? You just start with a scene? How do you find a way in usually? Research. You know, yeah, so it'll obviously be a germ of an idea. But then... Um, then it's 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 the, the as I say again the journalist in me know your subject so it's it's research 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 and that that's reading that's that's interviewing um, reading around the subject documentaries uh, talking with if I'm working with someone just just knocking it around getting different perspectives but it's it's there's there's so the the actual hitting the touching of the keypads is late in the process. Mm-hmm. By the time I actually start to formally write it, I, I, you know, my process would be to know as much about the subject as I could. So you kind of know where you're going. Do you tend to map out? Do you know? Because you, you mentioned yes. uh, earlier when you first started, you you said you didn't know that much about structure, but obviously, no, that's the right. Period of time that you've been doing it. So, do, is structure a big part of it now for you? Is that something you look at at the beginning? Do you map out scenes before you go ahead and start writing them? Yeah, yeah. I would, I would have a first version which says start here, then here, then here, then here. You know, and then gradually add flesh to that, and 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 add little bits of dialogue and add thoughts scenes yeah so it's just a gradual building up process what's your favorite part of the process and what's your least favorite part of the process would you say <sighs> um the blank page is the most is any writer will tell you is the most <laughs> daunting part of the process um i i do love that moment when i hand over i'm not a frustrated director i'm not a frustrated actor 
Yeah. So I love the moment when I hand it over, but it's also a frightening moment when the director and the actors take it over and make it theirs and it stops being yours. But you've come to terms with that, presumably, over the period that you've been in TV, especially because you started, as you say, like on the production side of things, didn't you? So you must have quite a good understanding yeah. well, of that. It, what, what that's about is making the right choices, so you know, yeah. choosing the right director and choosing the... Because obviously, I, 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 as a producer, I cast as well, yeah. so I'd be involved in the choices of who's playing who. Yeah. But yeah. Which makes a big, a big impact. So if you could go back, this is kind of wrap up then, if you could go back and give yourself one piece of yeah. career or life advice for when you were first getting started, if you could go back now, what would it be, do you think? Yeah. Um, embrace your... Embrace the arrogance of, of being a writer. And uh, what that means is, it is in, inherently arrogant to write down... A script is essentially a blueprint for a couple of hundred people to go and make a drama. Mm-hmm. And that's, it's sort of arrogant. It's just, you know, right, I want this character to say this, not this, but mm-hmm. this. Mm-hmm. And I want them to then move here and do this. <laughs> and I then want to cut to here and this. And so it's a load of orders. Mm-hmm. And if you're, I don't, what I'm not saying is be an arrogant person. No, no, I know what you're saying. But I'm saying don't lose your nerve. You know, I can so understand that. Embrace it's, that. Yeah, because it's something we talk about to quite a lot of uh, novelists, authors, writers, whatever. Is yeah. that it, it, you're right? It is a funny mix because on the one side, it's like, oh, we've got the ego to say, I'm going to create this thing, and I want other people to yeah. read it or watch it or whatever. It yes. is, depending on what kind of writing you do. But then the other side of it is, yeah. you know, most of us are we really, really full of self doubt the whole time we're doing it, and that this is a piece of crap. Yeah, and it's not. It's not worthy of anything. Yeah. it's a funny mix, isn't it? Yes, it is. And, it, and, it, and, I, and my advice would be uh, don't be scared of being of creatively arrogant. And then you'll be, you, because, you, because the stronger your vision and the more confident you're, the way you express it, the better the piece will be. Absolutely. Well, that's great. Well, just before we go, can you sort of give us a flavour of what's up next for Jeff Pope? What are we going to see next on our screens from you and what have you got in the pipeline? Um, um, the, the, I'm working with Steve Coogan again on a movie based on the, uh, housewife from Edinburgh who found the body of Richard III in a car park in Leicester. That's where I'm actually sitting at this very precise moment in time. In Leicester, so. <laughs> <laughs> I know the lady you mean, yeah. Philippa Langley, I mean, yeah, and yeah. she's, um, a very inspiring woman. But yeah, we've been working on that for a couple of years now and we're getting closer and closer. So that's the next big thing that Steve and I are on. Brilliant. Oh, brilliant. Well, that's uh, that's great. Well, good luck with Stan and Ollie. Uh, as I say, it's just uh, out today. I'm definitely going to be going Thanks, to see Ryan. it again. Take my wife with me this time. I'm going tonight. Oh, going brilliant. Tonight. Oh, brilliant. I'm going to sit quietly at the back with my wife and uh, I think a couple of my sons are going to go as well. There was, just see uh, how it goes down. Yeah, brilliant. Well, it was interesting when I saw it because there was kind of lots of uh, big burly Scottish men clearing their throat towards the end of the film. <laughs> <laughs> And they right. all seem to be a little bit misty-eyed when they came out as well. So, uh, yeah, ah. it's it's uh, it's a great achievement. So, uh, well done, and thanks for taking the time to talk to me. It's great. You're very welcome, and thanks, Wayne. Nice speaking to you. So, thanks again to Jeff Pope, and Stan and Ollie is in cinemas worldwide right now, and I definitely recommend it. So, that pretty much wraps it up for another episode, but don't forget there's another episode coming up on Tuesday with Merle Nygate talking about her espionage novel. Uh, and also, don't forget that you can find the entire back catalogue of interviews on the website, and make sure you subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Overcast, or wherever else you get your podcasts from to have the show downloaded automatically every single week. Uh, Next time, as I say, I'll be talking to Mel Nygate about her debut espionage novel, The Righteous Spy. Until then, thanks for listening. I'm Wayne Kelly. Happy writing and reading, and I'll see you next time. Joined up.